Hello everyone and welcome to our final video for the um, inductive arguments module uh, for critical reasoning. So this is video part number five and this is going to be the last one and I'll have to think of the code word at some point and I'm not going to forget this time um, so we'll figure something out here. Um, <clears throat> so I'll keep track of that. But we have um, one final criteria from the inference of best explanation argument that I didn't cover last time that I promised we'd talk about this time and this is a tricky one. Um, but we'll get that done, and then we'll talk about our last argument form, um, argument from analogy, and then we'll, that'll be it for this section. So um, I hope the uh, material's been treating you well. Let me know how I can help. There's a lot of details here in the inductive arguments section, um, and and like I've mentioned before, I think a lot of the devil here is uh, in, in the details of actually applying it. So <clears throat> as you actually start doing some homework problems, um, and getting some practice at explaining and articulating the thought process that you're using while you're applying these criteria. I mean, that's what's really tricky. Um, and that isn't... Um, so in, I, I expect that you might want some help with that, and let me know how I can help you. Um, I will be continuing to host my study sessions, and I'm always available... Oh, pardon me. I'm always available by appointment, so let me know how I can help. All right, so let's bring up our little chart that we had before. Here we go. So we have this one last um, standard <clears throat> to talk about, falsifiability. Um, I've stuck it over here because falsifiability is actually kind of like um, power in that it's going to get us to think about um, something that um, is, oh, that's not what we want. We want that to be green. There we go. Something that's outside of the stuff to be explained that we're anticipating, um, you know, uh, we have to, in order to test falsifiability, we have to imagine whether or not the hypothesis that's being offered could work as an explanation for something else. Although this time, what we're concerned about is um, the opposite of the stuff to be you might be able to squeeze this all in. <laughs> be explained. There, we can make this a little smaller, and that, and that I think that'll work. <coughs> Sorry, I got this dry cough today. Mm. Okay. Um, and as a little reminder here, and I'll, I'm going to explain this all in more detail here in a second. But <clears throat> what we're actually looking for, in order for the, um, in order for the hypothesis to Past the test of falsifiability, we actually want it to fail. And that's why I'm drawing this little X here. Let's actually uh, make it a little nicer. We want this X. We don't want it to work as an explanation for the opposite of the stuff to be explained. And, I'll, uh, and so let's talk about what's going on here. Um, I'm going to save this and let's get a blank thing here. Um, imagine, um, so there's, I like to sometimes use this sort of drawing. Um, there's what did happen versus what didn't happen. <clears throat> and then we've got our hypothesis. So, uh, what did happen, that's the thing that we want explained. But we can imagine other possibilities, like what if something different had happened instead? So like what happened instead of something else? And there's a line drawn between these two things. And we want the explanation that's being offered, the hypothesis, um, to kind of draw this line in the sand between what did happen versus what didn't happen. In other words, <clears throat> when we're asking for depth, we want the hypothesis to be able to give an explanation for why what did happen did happen. And, and a deep explanation in the sense that, given the hypothesis, it makes sense that you'd expect what did happen to happen if the hypothesis was true. Um, but we don't want it to work, uh, the same hypothesis to work as an explanation that would have would have been an effective deep explanation if something different had happened instead. If that's going on, it's kind of like the hypothesis works as an explanation for everything. And if it works as an explanation for everything, then it actually explains nothing. And I can use a kind of um, 
phrase, again, one that I, I kind of want to unpack. It's kind of a mouthful. It's kind of hard to necessarily hear it and just be like, oh, I understand now. But um, <clears throat> this is my, uh, this is kind of like some of the other standards I talked about. Uh, but this is, this is my way of defining falsifiability. One feature of a good explanation is that it doesn't only explain why what did happen did happen. It also explains why something different didn't happen instead. So, and that would be captured if the hypothesis would fail as an explanation if something different had happened instead. Okay, so let, let's use this example. I got I have this illustration I like for this. Um, let's say um, my kid gets a little older and has a fish, and then the fish dies. That's what happens. And then my, my kid comes to me and says, Daddy, why did the fish have to die? And um, I'm, so he's asking me for basically an explanation, uh, another claim, a hypothesis for why what did happen did happen. Now, if I said something like, um, because you poured Coca-Cola in the fishbowl as the explanation for why the fish died, um, then if we imagine if something different had happened instead, like the fish didn't die, and we wanted to explain why the fish was alive, using the hypothesis that you poured Coca-Cola into it wouldn't really make much sense. It would, it would fail as an explanation in that situation. It, wouldn't, it just wouldn't make sense. That's a good thing. That means that maybe the hypothesis is on to something. It's figuring out what's sort of the difference between why this thing happens instead of something else. But I could have given a different explanation. And, and by the way, I, when I'm using this illustration, this is not to like rag on um, religious perspectives or anything like that. I've, I think I've told all of you I'm religious myself. Um, but this is just, it's too good of an example to pass up here. Um, it just works, it works perfectly. Um, and there's actually a way to make this explanation not fall into the trouble of falsifiability. But I'm going to deal with a kind of cartoon version of this way of thinking. And um, I, I, it's a good illustration of what is the problem if an, if an explanation is not satisfying falsifiability. So imagine instead of telling my kid, and they're asking, why did the fish have to die? I don't give them some kind of explanation like you poured Coca-Cola into the fish tank. But what if I said something like, um, it was God's will for the fish to die? If I say that as an explanation for why the fish did die, this isn't a falsifiable explanation, and not just because of I don't have evidence to know that God exists or something like that. That's always the case when we're talking about the existence of something like God, and actually a, a great many other things, some of the things that even science depends on, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, imagine if something different had happened instead. Let's say the fish, it kind of looked sick, but then got better, and it didn't die. Um, could I explain that with the same claim that it was God's will for the fish to survive? You betcha. It would work just as effectively in that situation too. And actually, being completely sincere here, when people talk about the explanation of it was God's will for something to happen, part of the deep point about that is that no matter what happens, um, you can like kind of trust God, right? So. Um, the explanation of it being God's will is something that would work in every situation. But because it works in every situation, it's not telling me what draws the line between something happening versus something else not happening. If it works as an explanation for everything, then it's not really explaining any particular thing. Um, and that's a problem. So we actually, we actually want the hypothesis to not work if something different had happened instead. And this is the way that you can sort of test yourself. Um, so if I bring this back up, oops, yeah, let's get that in there. There we are. Um, when you're trying to have a method of testing whether an explanation is falsifiable, imagine that something different had happened instead of the thing that did happen. So just imagine the opposite, and then ask, could you use the same hypothesis to explain that stuff? And if it fails, that's a good thing. Then we're great. If it doesn't fail, then there's a problem with falsifiability. If it works as an explanation here, that's a bad result. That's not what we want. That makes for a worse explanation. Let me talk through a couple other examples, and in particular some that are, that are tricky here. 
Um, these are these are taken from um, the book too, I think. Um, so there's this uh, example about um, I didn't catch any fish, even though I've been fishing in this river all day. I didn't catch any fish because there aren't any fish in the river. So what did happen was that I didn't catch any fish. And my explanation, my hypothesis here is there are no fish in the river. Now that's a deep explanation. If there's no fish in the river, do you expect that you wouldn't catch any fish? Yep. So that's a nice deep explanation. No gaps here. But now let's see whether it works if something different had happened instead. So what happened? What did happen was I didn't catch any fish. What would be the opposite of that? I caught some fish. So what if I had caught some fish? Could I explain the reason why I caught the fish based on the fact that um, there were no fish in the river? No, that's completely absurd. <laughs> be like, so um, caught a bunch of fish today, and they're like, uh huh, really? So must not have been any fish in the river. Like, huh? It doesn't make any sense. This is a very wonderful example of just a blatant um, failure to explain if something different had happened, which is actually perfect. That's exactly what we want. That's great. We want it to fail. Um, that's maybe more of an indication that the, whether there are fish in the river or not is one of the really, you know, things that draws a line in the sand between catching fish and not catching fish. That's a good thing. Um, seems clear. Okay, so that's good. But now here's another problem that was in the homework. Um, I didn't catch any fish here because I was unlucky. Now, this is a little uh, stranger. <clears throat> um, for, for a couple reasons. So first, let's go through our same method here. So what did happen? I didn't catch any fish. My hypothesis, I was unlucky. If I had caught fish instead, it would be weird to say, well, I caught fish because I was unlucky in as much as catching fish is like a good result. So in that way, it doesn't make sense. But, you know, sometimes a hypothesis we could treat a little more charitably here and recognizing that maybe it's like got that under control. So maybe what's going on here with the hypothesis is that luck is the factor here. So um, what did happen was I didn't catch fish. Um, and so I was unlucky, but if I caught fish, then I'd be lucky. And so maybe that's the thing that draws the line in the sand here, is that there, there's a kind of appeal to luck here. Okay, and that's that's the main determiner. But even though it kind of, um, it doesn't make sense to explain how I did catch fish that I was unlucky, um, there's another kind of problem here for the appeal to luck. Um, in, the, in as much as... Um, luck doesn't really draw a firm line in the sand that explains why what did happen did happen as opposed to and and also at the same time why what didn't happen didn't happen that's the other thing that's the other kind of explanatory work that we want out of a hypothesis that it's it's appealing to something which answers both questions why what did happen did happen and why what didn't happen didn't happen we want to know both those things um, and luck is not going to be doing a good job of this and the reason why is that we would make a judgment of luck in a sort of post facto sort of way. So if I had caught fish, I would have said I was lucky. If I had not caught fish, I'd say I was unlucky. But it doesn't really show me what there is in reality that's sort of <clears throat> the difference maker here between catching fish and not catching fish. The, the way in which like an appeal to luck could work as a falsifiable explanation would be as if there was like some other way of having contact with uh, the reality of luck other than um, other than just looking at what happens what is the actual result so like imagine here I got this like detector I got this luck detector and I can like scan you and I can be like uh -huh, so you are very lucky today you have a lot of midi chlorians or whatever I don't know uh, you're really you're really lucky you should buy a lottery ticket today because we were able to confirm that you got the luck particles or something and if I'm scanning someone else and I'm like, ugh, you, you, shouldn't, you should actually stay home. Don't get in a car. Don't go on the freeway. Uh, pretty unlucky today. Not a lot of luck particles, so look out. If that was something we could do, then this could be a falsifiable explanation. Um, we could say, oh, that's the difference. You know, it's those luck particles that affect the outcome here. It is, <laughs> that's the causal framework of the universe. Um, I have no reason of thinking such things exist. Um, in the words of Han Solo, no mystical energy field controls my destiny. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if there was something like that, then that could work as a falsifiable thing. Think, think back to the fish example with there being no fish in the river. 
that's like a pretty major feature that would sort of draw the line for what makes the difference for catching fish and not catching fish. So that's what we're looking for. We want the explanation to work in the case that did happen. It's a deep explanation. Depth is one of our, our factors. And then falsifiability is like we don't want the same explanation to be successful in the case that something different had happened instead. If it fails in that case, then that means maybe this is the thing that's kind of the determiner between the two. <clears throat> so that's falsifiability. Um, I want to say one more thing. Um, some of you may have encountered the notion of falsifiability from maybe philosophy of science stuff and there, or um, other discussions about the way science functions. Um, this falsifiability uh, framework of thinking about scientific reasoning and the scientific method is um, a more mid-late 20th century sort of thing. Maybe you've encountered it. Um, maybe you've uh, read some Karl Popper or something like that, um, or Kuhn, or, but anyway, um, this notion of falsifiability is a little different from that one, because that one is that other notion of falsifiability that may hear bandied about when it comes to scientific reasoning is mostly about how um, science is in the business of testing claims that could be potentially proven true by a possible experience. This notion of falsifiability is a little different, um, but it is, it, it's, it, it's got a similarity in this regard, that if there's an explanation, like a, a story that you're telling to explain something, where no matter what could ever happen in the world, it could never fail as an explanation, kind of like everything that happens you could always chalk up to God's will, given the nature of God, like that would work. If it would work in every single case, then um, there's no way for the explanation to fail. There's no way for it to ever be wrong. So it doesn't really show us any insight about why things happen one way versus another. Um, I did promise that there's a way to like fix up this appeal to God's will, that it wouldn't have this kind of problem. And I think it's just to do this, um, to recognize that the appeal to God's will in giving an explanation is not to give a causal explanation. It's not to give an explanation in the sense of, why did something happen versus something else? Because the whole point of appealing to God's will is that we don't really know it. And so we kind of have to leave it up to God because we can't understand the explanation that's really present. We don't have access to the true explanation. Um, so, so there's really something more going on there. I'd say, like, if the kid, if you tell your kid the fish died and it was God's will, that's probably supposed to be something more just comforting, of just, like, knowing that... Um, that God cares about us and that sort of thing. I didn't want to get into a big theology thing here, but um, there. if you want to talk to me more about that, I'd be happy to. But again, that was not uh, an example meant to kind of like go after uh, religious perspectives as being irrational. That's not the point. There's a lot of ways that you could actually defend God's will as actually a meaningful explanation if you start cashing out what God's all about and what God's will is and why he would do things one way versus something else, then it could actually work as an explanation again um, that would be falsifiable. Um, kind of like there's a reason why... Um, <laughs> well, okay, yeah. That, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on the theology. That, that would just be getting into a rabbit hole that we don't need to. But uh, if you want to talk to me about it, I would be totally happy to. Um, so, there. So that's falsifiability. That's inference the best explanation. So now let's get into our final argument form, argument from analogy. And this will be a little shorter. I don't think this will take us quite as much time. OK. Um, again, I'm going to draw some pictures here to help uh, show you the model of how um, argument from analogy functions and how we are going to test it <clears throat> to figure out if it's strong or weak. All right, let's get, uh, let's get this here. OK. So now we're going to do uh, let's do this. Um, now we're going to do argument from analogy. Okay. So argument from analogy, I, I, I think, is going to be a little more familiar than inference of the best explanation. Um, there are some basic moving parts here. There's what I'm going to call <clears throat> oops, the case in question. 
and we're wondering, we're, we're trying to get a conclusion about what's going on in this case in question. What kind of um, properties, does it have a certain property or doesn't have a certain property? And in order to get straight on this, we're going to draw an analogy with some other case or cases. So we, I'm going to call this the um, analogous um, case or case is. Okay. In the book, and, in, and you can see in my lecture notes here, they're, they talk about object A has certain properties, objects B, C, D have properties, P, Q, R, and so on. Well, what So object A would be in my drawing here. Oops, not that one. Um, <clears throat> object A would be the case in question, and then the um, B, C, D, and so on uh, would be the um, would be these analogous cases. And then there's certain properties that they're all supposed to share. So um, the analogous case has properties P, Q, um, R, and maybe some other ones. And then um, the case in question also has those features. P, Q, R, and so on. For the so on here, I'm just going to draw like a little ellipses. So you could have more similarities. You could have less. It could just be one similarity between the two cases. But the bottom line is that um, both the analogous case and the case in question share certain properties. So these properties are true of these cases. Um, and the analogous case has um, what I'm just going to refer to, and I've used this in other argument styles too, I'm just going to call property X. So this is the sort of the disputed property. So if we're wondering whether the case in question has property X or not, we'll resolve this matter by drawing an analogy between... Um, the analogous case here uh, and the case in question. I don't want to, I'm sorry, I want to draw this differently. I'm going to do it like this. So, you know, they've got, there are these analogies between these, the feature, they, they have similar features, okay? This case is like that case. Here's a really silly example I like to use. Um, let's say uh, you've got a car, and I don't know much about your car. Um, other than I, some, one of the things you've told me. I haven't seen your car, and in particular, I don't know if your car goes fast. Going fast, the ability to go fast, we're going to call that property X here. But I'm like, okay, you've told me some things about your car. I, don't, I haven't seen the car, I haven't seen it in action, but I know that your car is kind of like my car in that they're both red, and my car goes fast. So the analogous case would be my car, and I know my car goes fast, and my car is red, and you told me you have a red car. So I'm going to think maybe it's true that you, that this other case in question, also has property X, that your car also goes fast. So I'm doing a little therefore symbol here again. Oh, man, that's the ugliest therefore symbol. I can do better. Just got to be slow and deliberate. There we go. Drawing with the mouse is the worst. So because your car and my car are the same with respect to color, I'm thinking maybe um, your car also has property X, the property of going fast. Now, this is a really terrible argument from analogy that I just made for you, but it is still an argument from analogy. This is still um, an instance of that kind of argument. It's just a poor version of it, okay? Um, but it's going to, all arguments from analogy are going to have these structural features to them. Um, one thing I want to alert you to right away, big, big deal here for evaluating arguments from analogy. Every quarter I teach this class, uh, and we get to the argument from analogy problem on the exam, I always have some students who tell me that the analogy is a good analogy because the cases that are being drawn in the, uh, together in the analogy have similar features. And that is never a good explanation of whether the analogy is a good one or a bad one. More features, less features actually doesn't matter. Um, more or less is not going to make a difference. Certainly, um, 
the more features that are similar, the more opportunity there is for a good argument from analogy, but it, on, an, on its own, doesn't matter. And the fact that things are similar doesn't mean they're going to be similar in all respects. Okay? This is why argument from analogy is extremely fallible and why we have to go looking to other features to figure out whether it's a strong analogy or a weak one. So just as a warning right here, I mean, you can just put this in your back pocket. You can never explain the strength of an argument from analogy by just saying, look, at they have the same things going on. That's not enough. Every argument from analogy has similar features. Otherwise, it wouldn't be argument from analogy. So all, all attempts at this will have that structural feature of similar properties. So this one about your car going fast because mine goes fast and they're both red, that's a terrible argument from analogy. But it still fits all the things that we're looking for. Let's go back to the lecture notes here for a second. Um, so object A, here, let's, let's just fill it in from how the book talks about it. Um, so the case in question, which the book refers to as object A, um, and the analogous cases are B, what the book refers to as B, C, D, and so on. Okay. By the way, this could just be one case. That'd be fine too. Like your car, my car. That's an, a an analogy. Um, so that's that's how this is. So we've got all the structural features here. Object A has properties P, Q, R, and so on. That's this saying that object A has these things going on. Objects B, C, D, and so on have properties P, Q, R, and so on. So the analogous cases also have those properties. Objects B, C, and D also have property X. So they've got this thing going on. Those three things, that this thing has this, that these things have these, and it has this. Those are the three premises needed to make argument from analogy work. And the conclusion is, therefore, object A also probably has property X. Okay. Now there's another version of argument from analogy in terms of how it might be worded that you might encounter. In fact, there's an extremely famous argument from analogy from contemporary philosophy and contemporary ethics that I actually want to share with you that it, when the, this philosopher is making their argument in their paper, uh, and the philosopher's name, by the way, is, is uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson, when she's arguing, um, she, uh, she actually uses a slightly different way of talking about uh, argument from analogy when she's making the argument. So check this one out. Objects B, C, D, and so on have property X. That's one premise. And then the next claim is this. It's a little different than the other version. Object A is similar to B, C, D, and so on in all of the X relevant ways. So that's a big different uh, claim going on here. So <clears throat> the first thing that is being claimed is that B, C, D, and so on have property X. But then they're saying that there's the that these the case in question and the analogous case are the same with respect to every feature that would affect whether or not something could have property X. If they're the same with respect to everything that can affect whether or not you have property X, then they then this definitely has property X if this one does. Okay? So when you're looking at this argument, this is actually a, a deductive, a valid argument. Um, <clears throat> there's no way that these two things could be true and yet this could be false okay but um, this is not really making the argument any stronger okay so a lot of times remember there's there's two things that we care about for a good argument all true premises good support relation um, validity is definitely the best we could be doing on the support relation issue but it comes at a trade-off of making it harder to defend the truth of the of the premises involved to claim that the two cases, the, the disputed case and the analogous cases, are the same in all of the X relevant ways. One, you've got to know what all the X relevant ways are, and two, you've got to be able to confirm that they, they share them all. And it's probably the first part there that makes this the most fallible. Um, we don't know, we don't have some kind of exhaustive list of any of the causal properties that happen in the universe. It's always possible with the way we have our, our current understanding of science, the amount of knowledge we've got. We have to accept that it's always possible that we could be surprised that there's something, some other new way in which a, an effect can happen that isn't a way that we've ever seen it happen before. That there could be other version, other causes that could cause that to happen. We can't eliminate those possibilities. There might be other factors here that affect something that we, we can't anticipate. Now, 
Judith Jarvis Thompson's example, which I'm going to talk you through right now, her this argument from analogy she's making is a moral argument. So that's a little different because moral truth is not something that you can investigate by doing some experiments in the world, and at least not in the way that science does experiments. This isn't a matter of a, you don't observe moral properties the way that you can observe um, surface reflectance properties or momentum or something like that, um, the speed of something. It, you don't measure morality empirically, um, at least not strictly speaking. If you want to talk to me about that, I can give you a, probably a two-hour lecture on that if you want. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about there. But anyway, Tar uh, Thompson's argument works like this. And I'll go back to the drawing here to explain this. The case in question that she's trying to make an argument for is a very controversial topic, um, the topic of abortion. And actually, before we get back into this, I'm just, I want to take a look at you again. Hello. Um, I'm using this argument because it is a perfect example of argument from analogy, and to know that you can use argument from analogy as a part of making moral arguments is actually a pretty cool feature. Um, this argument that I'm about to give you, I'm, I'm not trying to use this as a platform for arguing for one type of perspective or another. Uh, the abortion debate is really contentious, and it's contentious among philosophers too. I mean, there's a lot of arguments here. Um, on both sides to be looking at things and and it's not clear I mean, there's not a clear consensus here um, from the arguments that are on the table about what is the right way to think about abortion it's a serious issue with a serious debate um, and uh, <clears throat> there are people who feel like it is resolved but if we look at things kind of overall um, I think we have to say the jury is still out at least from looking at it from a philosophical perspective if we're looking at moral arguments um, for its permissibility, for its impermissibility, um, there's a lot of arguments on both sides, and there's and and in a way that those arguments have not been resolved. Because sometimes you could have an argument, but someone could show that it's a bad argument, or object to it, or defeat it, or something like that. But but right now there are arguments on both sides that are still sort of standing that have have not been absolutely defeated. But this, so this is just one argument in the debate. I'm not trying to settle it. I don't think that Thompson's case proves it without a doubt. But it is, a, it is an interesting argument, and it has a kind of compellingness to it. It has some force to it um, that requires us to kind of take it seriously in the debate. Um, but here's the, so abortion, like we are just saying, is an extremely contentious topic. And Thompson's like, we can't really appeal to our intuitions directly because our intuitions are so, you got some people who are like, totally this is absolutely immoral it should never be done there are other people who are like I don't see any moral problem with this whatsoever so our, our moral intuitions are kind of all over the place here um, there isn't a kind of clear indication of what is the consensus among intuition so we can't appeal to that to resolve the disagreement um, if it was if we had a kind of a clear intuition about things then that would be a, whoa the video freaked out there for a second sorry about that <clears throat> I bet it was a totally unflattering still anyway um, so, uh, so Thompson's going to try to make an argument to help us uh, deal with the, evaluating the case of abortion um, when our intuitions might be uh, unable to assist us because they're so controversial. What Thompson wants to do <clears throat> is draw an analogy between a case of abortion and a different case which has nothing to do with abortion, but which we have uh, intuitions that have far more agreement um, among us. So there's a, a much greater consensus. It's less contra the intuition, our intuitive judgment about this other scenario is not as controversial. And again, you might disagree with Thompson's case here. I and mean, I'm not saying that this argument is perfect. It's just a perfect example of this other sort of form in which argument from analogy can happen. And I want to show you how it is still fallible, that it, it's still. Um, the fact that the argument is deductive actually doesn't make it um, any uh, stronger. You're just kind of trading off instead of having um, problems maybe with the support relation of the argument. Now you got problems with proving that all the premises are true. So let's take a look. The case in question that um, Thompson wants to talk about is abortion, a case of, uh, of an abortion where the pregnancy was caused by rape. And she wants to relate that to this um, kind of wacky thought experiment called the violinist case. Um, and in the violinist case, you are uh, kidnapped in the middle of the night, 
and you wake up, uh, you're kidnapped by uh, a society of music lovers who um, have kind of decided to take matters into their own hands. There's a really famous violinist who's about to die who needs, uh, he's got a blood disease. He's got toxins in his blood that he can't, his body can't process. Um, <clears throat> and he's been trying to get help, but no one has been available or he's low on the list or something like that. And so he's not going to get help before he dies. And the Society of Music Lovers discovers that you are a blood type match. In fact, you're the only blood type match that this would work for. And so they kidnap you. Uh, you wake up in a warehouse hooked up to this violinist where your body is processing the toxins in, in the violinist's blood. Um, and the, you know, the cops are there, paramedics, and they're like, whoa. And you're waking up and you're like, this is strange. Um, but they're like, well, now that you're hooked up to the violinist, um, you kind of got to maybe stay hooked up to the violinist. Because if you disconnect yourself from the violinist, the violinist will die. And there's no way of plugging someone else in or anything else. I mean, this procedure's the ball is rolling, and there's no way to go back on it now. You either have to stay hooked up to the violinist for nine months to uh, clear his blood of the toxins, or... Um, you disconnect yourself, and that would result in in the um, violinist death. Okay, so what Thompson has tried to do uh, is create a case that is going to be the same as abortion, where the pregnancy was caused by rape, in all the ways that are morally relevant. And that's the key idea here. They're definitely different in so many other matters. That you know, abortion, abortion, and violinists <clears throat> very, very different. And a violinist is not a fetus, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but this is part of the um, what Thompson's up to here. That um, they don't need to be the same in every regard. They just need to be the same in all of the ways that could affect the moral judgment we would make about the case. So going back to this format, um, Thompson is saying the violinist or the um, the case of abortion where the pregnancy was caused by rape is similar to the case of the violinist in all of the morally relevant ways because property X is supposed to be, for Thompson's argument, that the action is morally permissible. I mean, when she's got this violinist case, then she thinks we're all going to have the intuition that it's morally permissible for us to disconnect ourselves from the violinist, that it would be really nice of us to stay hooked up to him and save his life, but we are not under an obligation to do that. Um, Thompson thinks that that's the intuition that um, most of us are going to have. Again, you might disagree with Thompson about this, but um, sort of one of the things that's, that is definitely clever about this argument and is kind of cool is that um, Thompson has been able to construct a case where even if it's not possible for you to be pregnant or to be pregnant because of rape, if that's just not something that maybe is biologically possible, like it's not biologically possible for me to give birth to a child. I've always wanted to since I was a kid, and I've been like, Carr says I don't have a womb. Uh, I've always wanted to do that, and actually watching my partner go through it made me even more sad about that. But anyway, it's not possible for me to do it. So in some ways, it's really hard for me to um, put my imagination in the place of, of a woman who is pregnant because of rape and is trying to decide whether to get an abortion or not. It's really hard for my moral intuitions to sort of fit that scenario because I don't. It's very hard for me to have a frame of reference for that. But Thompson, if she is successful in her argument, has been able to come up with an example that it doesn't matter whether you have the the ability to become biologically pregnant or not. Um, you can. Everyone can empathize. Can imagine themselves in the situation of this person who's been kidnapped by the Society of Music Lover and, and, is, and is hooked up to the violinist. So that's that's kind of a special thing about this argument. A second thing, though, is uh, and that you might not expect someone to do this, um, Thompson is, uh, even though she's arguing for the permissibility of abortion, actually um, uh, grants, for the sake of argument, that the fetus has a right to life. And that's the, her whole kind of argument of ambition in putting this argument together, is to show that even if the fetus has a right to life, that doesn't mean that um, all abortions are impermissible, that it would always be wrong. But the that's one thing that they're sort of morally similar on. Like the, the violinist is a person with a right to life, and she's granting, fine, the fetus has a right to life too, sure. Um, both of their lives depend on you. 
um, that there's not someone else that they could make um, that they could become dependent on. That's not an option. It's going to take nine months. Um, the uh, the person in question, the violinist or the fetus, is not morally responsible for you being in this position. Um, the violinist didn't tell the the Society of Music Lovers to kidnap you, so that's a morally relevant feature that's the same. Um, <clears throat> What puts you in this situation is a is an, a morally incorrect action, like rape is is immoral, and so is kidnapping. Those are both wrong things. So that's the same thing. I mean, I would say, in all in all fairness, there are definitely some aspects uh, between the two cases that are definitely different, that are morally relevant features. But many of them kind of work more for Thompson's analogy to work. But um, I, I think I've already said too much about the about this particular argument because my point is not to do that, but um, to just sort of show you another illustration of how uh, argument from analogy could work. That's a little different than some of these other cases that we've been talking about that are a little more scientific. I mean, this this even works for things like moral properties that we're like the the kind of the basic logic behind this, especially in the moral context, is that if two cases are the same in all the ways that affect a moral outcome, then they need to receive the same moral judgment. And to do anything different would be guilty of being guilty of a double standard, to be a hypocrite, basically. Um, the sort of mantra of applied ethics, which is where this argument comes from, is the demand to treat like cases alike, to have the same moral evaluation for cases that have the same morally relevant features, but to treat different cases differently. That if two cases are different with respect to morally relevant features, we need to respect those moral differences and be sensitive to them as a part of making a moral evaluation of them. Not all situations are the same. Some situations have, have this a morally relevant feature is present in one case and it's not in a different case, and that might matter. Um, for instance, I, the example I always like to use is like, um, you know, if students are accept, if I ask me to turn in late work. It might matter what the circumstances are for why the homework was late, if I'm going to allow that to happen or not, um, or excused absences or something like that. It's not that I'm holding double standards on people. It's that there's a feature of cases that is relevant to whether or not it's okay or not okay for me to to um, offer late work or, or whatever it is. Whatever. That's just another kind of policy example. Okay, so I think we. I wanted this lecture to be short, and it's already getting so long. Um, so hopefully you got a good idea here about how argument from analogy works. Again, I think this is going to be a pretty familiar model. Um, we're relate, we relate cases to other cases to try to make sense of them. Okay, now how do we evaluate arguments from analogy? How do we tell whether they're strong or weak? Again, we can't tell by just saying, hey, look, they have similarities, so it's a good argument from analogy. Every argument from analogy is going to have that feature. There's going to be the similarities. So we need some other criteria here. Um, here's what the book talks about. Again, they bring up this idea that the pre premises must be true. Don't worry about this. I don't care about that standard. Um, <clears throat> every argument, we need the premises to be true. And the case, actually, the case you're going to have on the exam, you won't be able to know if the premises are true or not. You're just going to have to take it at face value. I've, I've got a fictional characters. I, they're actually some of my friends. But <clears throat> I have fictional characters in um, to you, you don't know these people, so you just kind of have to take uh, the person who's arguing, take their word for it. So that doesn't matter. But these three things are the things that matter. That the cited similarities must be relevant to the claim of the conclusion, that they must be important, and that there must be an absence of relevant disanalogies. And then there's this other sort of side standard. Um, <clears throat> basically, the stronger the conclusion, the stronger the analogy must be to be a good argument from analogy. Um, this is the same sort of thing we talked about before when we were talking about guarding. If I make a strong conclusion, I need more evidence to back it up. If I make a weaker conclusion, if I guard my conclusion, I don't need to do as much to defend it. So that should be another familiar idea here. But the three things we really want to focus on are these three standards here. So let's talk about them. And I'm going to draw again as a way of making this easier. <clears throat> so. The first standard of, um, of relevance is basically looking for you to ask the question, is there any thread of connection that connects these properties with property X? So the things that are cited as the similarity, 
is there any reason to connect them as relevant for whether or not something would have property X or not? Oh, that one got out of control. Um, you've had to make judgments of relevance with regard to many of the other standards for the other forms of inductive reasoning. You've had to do that before. And it's the same thing here. And if you want to know how to explain your answer, and again, explanation is going to matter a lot for all these standards with argument from analogy. Uh, the problem of these exam on the exam that's an argument, there's one problem on argument from analogy on the exam. Uh, most of the partial credit I, I'm going to be giving is based on your explanation, how good your explanation is. How do you explain whether, and how do you think about whether or not there's a connection of relevance? Again, you have to use your background assumptions about the world, of what you know about how the world works, to be able to figure out if there's a connection of relevance between these two things. But the most important thing to do to explain whether you think it's relevant or not is to explain what the ground of relevance would actually be. So um, if, uh, well, let's I have that silly example of um, the uh, red car going fast sort of thing, right? That your car must go fast because it's red like my car that goes fast. It's a terrible argument. Why? Because there's not really any connection between whether the car is red or not and uh, whether it goes fast. Um, now, someone might, um, is a, <laughs> students always impress me on every single example I ever come up with. Uh, it seems to be one of your favorite pastimes, students, to challenge me on my examples. They're like, oh, but there is a connection of relevance. Um, the idea is supposed to be, uh, this is what I've heard a student argue me, to, with me before, that, well, red is a car that is more commonly associated with sports cars, and sports cars generally go faster than other kinds of cars. So there is kind of a connection with it being red and, and its likelihood of going fast. Um, even the insurance companies are aware of this, and uh, that's why rates on red cars are higher, um, because insurance companies don't care about what's really the causal parameters of things. They just look at the statistics. <laughs> For them, correlation is causation, as far as they're concerned. Uh, again, the video is freaking out. That's weird. Um, so, if you get, if you, if there's th this example is a good one, and I brought it up for a reason, not just because of um, you know trying to cover my butt on my examples or something, but um, it doesn't matter how strong the connection is when we're testing relevance. The way to think about relevance is just asking, is there any thread of connection that connects the cited similarities with the property in question? And as long as that's happening, then it's relevant. And all I really need you to do for, for the explaining your answer is to identify what is the ground of that connection. If there is a thread, what is the thread that holds it together? It could be a pretty weak thread, or it could be pretty strong and that does matter, but that's what we get into when we get into our second standard here of importance. And the, my favorite way of describing importance is you can imagine it as like how tight is the connection between these things. So uh, I'm going to play around with the. And notice how I drew a line for each of the cited similarities. Um, this is an important point. When you're testing relevance, you have to test relevance for each feature taken individually. You don't want to pork bar barrel all these things together. You don't want to just lump all the cited similarities. So if I'm saying, oh, well, your car probably goes fast because it's like my car, which goes fast because they're both cars. They're both red. They both have a V12 engine or I don't know anything about cars. So I shouldn't be doing this. Um, they both have, uh, I don't know, V12 is a lot. or They have a lot of horsepower. Um, and they both have a bicycle rack on top. I mean, each of those cited similarities, some of them are relevant in different ways than other ones. And I'd argue some of them are completely irrelevant. Um, well, yeah, you can tell a story about relevance for just about anything. Um, or a, a lot of things. So again, all I need you to do is just identify the ground of the connection. Importance is when we're going to figure out how tight of a connection is that. Uh, so in the picture here, I'll draw it like this. And again, just like with relevance, you have to uh, address each cited similarity one at a time on a sort of individual basis. So what I'm trying to basically draw here is that like this thread of connection could be like weaker or stronger. You know, it could be thicker or thin, um, and that's going to be importance. So actually, let me let me draw some. 
So standard number one <clears throat> is relevance. Okay, and that's like this dotted line business. And then, um, and then we have standard number two, which is importance. Okay. And that's what we're talking about uh, here with this thick line here. Okay, and then relevance is just, is there a thread of connection? That's how I'm drawing it here. And again, you have to come up with all this stuff. You have to use your background assumptions. But if you're going to say that the cited similarities, the PQR and so on, are important for property X, then what you're basically saying is that they are the centrally important elements that determine whether or not something has property X or not. So for instance, uh, I mentioned the bike rack. Bike rack, I was like, maybe that's irrelevant. Maybe it's not irrelevant to whether the car can go fast in as much as uh, it's wind resistance. Right? It'll put some drag on the car, it slows down the car, then as opposed to if it was streamlined, no, no bicycle rack going on. Um, that'd be So that would affect the speed. But it's not a centrally important determining factor because the impact on the speed is so small. Um, there's a lot of other factors like the size of the engine, how much horsepower, um, how heavy is the car. Like there's so many other things that are going to be more centrally important for whether or not cars go fast or not. Okay, so that's that's what you have to think about with importance. And again, explain your answer just using the knowledge you have of the world, sort of background assumptions, um, in order to inform that. Now, the case that I have on the exam, I've tried very hard to pick a case that I think uh, everyone has uh, some background assumptions about. You may feel like you uh, have more or less uh, experience with the example that I am going to have on the exam. <clears throat> but if you're running into trouble, if you're like, I don't feel like I have any background assumptions for knowledge about what's going on here, um, then I would say contact me. Again, you're going to have that 24-hour period to do the exam just like before. Contact me. Talk to me about it. and Let's talk it over a little bit. But I, I think... My, my guess is, is that you've got some background assumptions, even if you're not experienced with this, which I assuredly not all of you are um, going to have had some personal experience with the, the setting of, um, of my example. But you should still have, I, my guess is you've got some, ba some background assumptions. You have some things that you at least think you know about what's going on here. And that should be enough for you to answer the question. And again, the actual detail of the um, whether you say it's strong or weak doesn't matter to me as much as how you explain your answer because even if you've got different background assumptions or you make a different conclusion um, we can all be playing by the same rules the same criteria here of relevance importance and then the third one that we have to talk about the last one here which is absence of relevant disanalogies and this is also um, remember again everything that I'm doing in green you have to come up with yourself so a disanalogy is actually going to be a different case that you're going to come up with using your own imagination. You're going to try to be sensitive to. This would be a disanalogy case, or a disanalogous, I guess I should say. Disanalogous case. Okay. And what's going on here is that the disanalogous case um, has uh, does not have property X. So I'm going to do that as doesn't have property. That, remember the logical symbol here for not? That's what I'm using there, just for shorthand. It doesn't have property X, but um, it does have, um, let's call S, um, <clears throat> T, uh, U, and so on features. And the case in question has S, uh, T, and U properties um, and so so that's also going on here and the STU properties I mean the disanalogous case could have properties PQR as well the only thing that matters is that there is a thread of connection that ties together the case in question with this disanalogous case the same way that we had um, this analogous case originally so just like you had an original analogy which is suggesting to you that the case in question has property X, what's going on with the disanalogy is you got another case which suggests the opposite. 
So this is kind of like a tug of war. And actually, I've got a silly little story to explain sort of the force of, of disanalogies. And this is kind of like a fairy tale story. So imagine, you know, you're lost in the woods. It's like fairy tale sort of thing. You're lost in the woods. You don't know which way is home. And you're kind of just wandering around, and you don't know what to do. And then a dude just like pops out of the bu bushes and is like, home is that way. And then you're like, well, I don't know anything about this dude or the advice he's giving me, but it's better than nothing. I might as well go this way. So you start going this way for a little while. And then another dude pops out of the bushes. He's like, hey, home is that way. And now you're like, shoot, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to go this way or this way? I got a report that, that you know, was better than nothing. If, it was, if that had been the only thing, I would have gone that way. But if this had been the only thing, I would have gone that way. And now I feel even more confused than I was at the beginning. That's kind of like how disanalogies work. And that ar all arguments from analogy are really fallible. They're really fallible. This is one of the weakest forms of inductive reasoning that we've got. But it is still a rational form of reasoning, and it can be better or worse. Um, and this is one thing that would make it worse. If there's a disanalogy present, if there's a possible disanalogy. If there's an absence of disanalogies, if we're like thinking about them, and we're like, yeah, I can't think of any cases that would maybe suggest the opposite conclusion, then that's going to make an argument from analogy stronger. But that's what we have to be sensitive to. So we have to use a lot of imagination here. So let's go through it again one by one so you know how you need to be thinking about a problem in order to test whether it has disanalogies present or not. This is this is going to take some like active imagination here. That's why I do this thing with the different colors to emphasize it. Like every Everything in green will not be given to you in the problem. The only thing that you'll get in the details of an argument from analogy problem that you're given to analyze is uh, all this stuff in black here. That's it. Everything else you have to come up with. So you need to think, basically. You need to use your imagination. Try to come up with a case, some situation or circumstance, that doesn't have the property in question from what the conclusion is, um, but has similarities with the case that the conclusion is about. So th there's some connection here. You don't need to be looking for a case that's similar to the analogous cases. That's not the point. You have to draw an analogy only with the case in question. So there was um, there was a, a problem on the homework that's about um, um, this Siamese cat will probably bite me because my aunt's Siamese cat cat bit me. Okay, so the case in question is this Siamese cat. I don't know anything about this cat. I just met it. I don't really know anything about it. But I'm thinking maybe it's going to bite me. Why? Well, because it's similar to my aunt's cat, which is also Siamese, that definitely bit me. That, I mean, that happened to me. Okay, so the analogous case, the one, so the case in question is this cat in front of me. The, the analogous case is my aunt's cat. And what are the cited similarities? Uh, that they're both cats, that they're both Siamese, that kind of thing. And uh, the, the cat, <clears throat> my aunt's cat bit me, so maybe that means this cat will also bite me. If you're going to make a disanalogy to this case, you have to come up with some other, probably a cat, that is similar to this cat. Not that similar to my aunt's cat. That doesn't matter. You only have to think about this cat and something, another cat or something that's similar to it that doesn't bite. Okay. So when you're looking for disanalogies, don't worry about the analogous cases. That's not what's important here. The disputed case is the thing you need to make a, another argument from analogy that basically speaks to the opposite conclusion. If you can't do that, then talk me through why you think you can't, <laughs> or what you tried and what you thought about to do that. Um, but if, I mean, the answer, if you think there is a disanalogy, just give me the disanalogy, and that's the way that you explain your answer, is by like, well, here it is, here's a disanalogy. Um, the, the important thing here, though, I mean, and this is where there might need be some extra need for explanation, is the disanalogy that you're constructing still has to be relevant. In other words, it's got to be doing a decent job on this relevance importance stuff too for the connection it's trying to draw. Now that doesn't mean you have to go through all the steps there, but you, when you're trying to like imagine a disanalogy that is worth mentioning here, make sure it's not a like really, really weak one like your car goes fast because it's red like my car, which goes fast. So um, that's argument from analogy. That's everything that we've got going on there. Um, relevance, importance, and relevant disanalogies. That's what we're listening for. So 
Um, I'm not going to forget about the code. So um, let's think of a code here. Oh, man. Mm. I've just been so tired this week. Um, but I think I've already used, like, nap time and sleeping and stuff as codes before, so I should probably stop that. Uh, how about... Um, how about Thanksgiving vacation? <laughs> That's going to be our code word for this time, because I can't wait for Thanksgiving vacation. I need a break. Uh, but thank you for your patience with getting uh, all these video lectures up. Um, and uh, I hope you've been keeping up with the, with the material and it's been going okay. And let me know how I can help more. So that's our code word for tonight. It is uh, for, the, for this batch will be Thanksgiving vacation. Um, looking forward to it. Okay, so um, I'll see you next time. Uh, we this is this is actually going to be the last uh, part of the second module of the course. So the next thing that's coming up is exam number two. So I, I will be giving a um, there's a study guide up. Oh, the, it froze again. There we go. Um, so next bit is the is the exam number two, and I'm I've got a study guide up for that. Um, I'm I'm probably going to do another little video like I did before once you take the exam so that you can I can walk you through all the instructions of it when you're taking it but it, it, the format's going to be the same you're going to have 24 hours to work on it um, and it's going to cover quite a lot of material again because um, we it, it basically covers all the formal logic stuff and all the inductive argument stuff so that means translations truth tables and using truth tables to check arguments for validity and then it'll mean statistical generalizations and applications, um, the uh, SCT, NCT stuff for causal reasoning, being able to run the sufficient necessary condition tests, and then inference of best explanation, argument from analogy. So there's quite a bit of material here to learn. I mean, the number of problems is not going to be that great on the exam, but the amount of time that it spends to do those problems is pretty significant. Um, and you'll want to think through your answers carefully here. Um, and so getting some practice with it and checking with me a lot I think is really important. Um, Fine-tuning and calibrating your um, explanations and answers for the inductive reasoning section in particular is something um, that I would um, say have, have kind of on your radar to be careful with that. Um, another warning that I have for you is to not underestimate um, how robust your explanations need to be with your answers. Uh, certainly on the exam, more explanations better than less. But think about it like this. Um, I think I might have mentioned this in the last exam. I'm looking to give you credit. I just need an excuse. I need you to give me the excuse by showing me in your explanation that you know what these things are asking about. Because when you're doing the exam, you can pull from your lecture notes. You've got the book right in front of you while you're doing it. Anybody can pull this stuff, uh, can pull words and language off of the book. Um, what you need to do is sort of demonstrate. you got to prove to me through your explanation that you actually know what you're talking about when you're throwing those words around and when you're applying these criteria to evaluate a case. Um, so just telling me what your evaluation is is insufficient. You're going to have to explain it to me. So approach the homework problems that way to get practice with that. And, um, you know, you'll be able to see my answer key for, for the 8, 9, 10 stuff, um, chapters 8, 9, 10 material. If you have any questions at all, come and talk to me. Find some way to get a hold of me. It's a touch base about it um, so we can we can work on it. Usually it takes a little bit of calibration here that your, your first intuitive gut an, uh, reactions to applying and wielding these principles is not quite on the mark. It's a little maybe off. And we can line it up and, and be like, don't you don't have to worry about that. This is something to pay attention to. Or, you know, each student comes at this from, in my experience, comes at this from a different place. Some things are easier, some things are harder. Different students have different idiosyncratic ways of thinking, and there, you might have your blind spots in different places. So working with me to calibrate your intuitions and your, your ability to make these judgments, to apply these principles, is a big deal. I think most of what you get from these video lectures is just an understanding of the idea, but not necessarily the understanding of how to use it to actually do an analysis. So that's something we can work on together. Um, and it takes practice to do it. Once you once you actually try it on for your own for yourself doing some of the homework problems in the exercises that are assigned, uh, I think you'll you'll see it. It feels a lot different than just trying to understand it intellectually. 
So I'll leave it at that, and um, I'll see you next time. Good luck with everything.